Welcome to the Have More Fun Podcast. In this episode, I talk with Oshita Moore about having adventures, being a peacemaker, and raising world citizens. Yes, I totally have a lot of peacemaking values. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked this because I really, because I, <laughs> I shared a lot of things that we do, and I'm like, I'm, I'm great, but I'm not that great. <laughs> say that when certain truths are forgotten, it makes you want to say, hold my purse, hold my earrings. <laughs> Have you ever actually said that in real life? Oh, I say, hold my purse, hold my earrings all, well, I mean, yes, yes, I do say it in my real life. <laughs> there have been a few times in my life that I have said it. <laughs> oh, for sure. That's the first thing <laughs> off the bus. Mommy won't believe what happened. Exactly. You won't believe what so and so did. Exactly. Yeah. And they want to tell you like word for word. In 2012, Colombia was in the middle of what would turn out to be a 52 year civil war. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, also known as FARC, had been attempting to overthrow the government in the longest running war in the Western Hemisphere leaving 220,000 people dead and millions displaced. With no sign of resolution, Colombia's Ministry of Defense decided that they needed to get more creative in order to try to bring peace to their country. And so they came up with one of the most unusual ideas in modern warfare, an advertising campaign. They hired a creative ad executive and native Colombian, Jose Miguel Sokoloff, to somehow convince thousands of rebel fighters to give up without firing a shot. How did he do it? Using Christmas trees and moms. Having grown up in Bogota, Sokoloff had never experienced a day of peace in his entire life due to the fact that the war had started before he was born. So he understood firsthand how high the stakes were. The plan he and his team concocted was to create a series of advertising campaigns to convince the guerrillas to surrender and simultaneously convince the Colombian people to accept them back into normal life. The only problem was the guerrillas were scattered throughout 175,000 dense acres of jungle. So they got creative. In December 2010, he and his team launched Operation Christmas. At great risk, Black Hawk helicopters carry two of Sokolov's colleagues, led by Colombian special forces, into rebel territory. They found nine 75 foot trees near guerrilla strongholds and decorated them with Christmas lights. Each tree was rigged with a motion detector that lit up the tree and a banner when the guerrillas walked by. And the banner read If Christmas can come to the jungle, you can come home. At Christmas, everything is possible. And it worked. Hundreds of rebel fighters turned in their weapons and stopped fighting. But it wasn't until 2013 that they really brought out the big guns, the rebels' bombs. It was called the Mother's Voice Campaign, because what Sokolov and his team had learned in talking with the rebel fighters is that one of their biggest worries was that they would come home and be rejected by their families. So they thought about who is most likely to forgive, and of course, moms came to mind. The campaign included 30 moms whose children had run away to fight. They shared photos of their missing kids, and Sokolov and his team made them into posters with a message from their mom that read, Before you were a gorilla, you were my son. Come home, because I'm waiting for you. Some of the moms had already been waiting at that point for 20 years. And after seeing messages from their moms, nearly 300 gorillas, roughly 5% of the rebel force at the time, came out of the jungle and gave up. It has been the most successful peacemaking efforts Colombia experienced. Moms are powerful peacemakers, which is why I'm so excited to talk with Oshita more today. Oshita is a speaker, writer, and an advocate for peacemaking and racial reconciliation. She's also the founder of Shalom in the City blog, where she says that peacemaking is the primary way to see changes in our culture. In fact, Shalom is a Hebrew word for peace with a richer, fuller picture of the world at its best, flourishing, unified, and vibrantly whole. She's the author of a book titled Shalom Sisters that is coming out October 3rd, but that is available for pre-order now. What I love about Oshida is that she is reminding us that peacemaking is not just something that we leave to the professionals. Instead, it's a practice that can invade our everyday. And just in case, when you hear the word peacemaking, you have negative connotations, that it means being a doormat or avoiding hard conversations, lying to someone else to make them feel better, or ignoring your boundaries, or people-pleasing, or making yourself small or passive to make others comfortable, Oshida tells us it's actually the opposite. 
It's a powerful posture that helps us advocate for others and bring hope and healing to our communities and the world. And so without further ado, here is my friend, Oshita Moore. I absolutely knew that we were going to be friends the moment that I read <laughs> your bio, because in it you write that you that your self-proclaimed urban dictionary description of your name says you are a peacemaker who loves Jesus a lot and cusses a little. Yes. Which makes me so <laughs> incredibly happy. That's a relief because it's kind of like a vulnerable thing you put out there like, yeah, my language is salty sometimes. Totally. <laughs> So yeah, so that makes me feel really good. Totally. I was at an event recently and it was like a sea of church people mm -hmm. and which I love church people, like no judgment whatsoever. I am a church person and um, we were all asked to share about what we do. And because I lead an organization that works with moms, I said, we believe that moms are badass. And I just kept going on about the work we do. And it was like, there was a collective gasp in the room, right? Oh, I, I believe it. Which is so hilarious. But then afterward... I had at least 20 people come up and like whisper in my ear like, I think moms are badass too. I'm like, thank you for saying that. Yeah. I love the way that you weave words together mm, and the beauty that you bring. And I think both of us can agree like words are so powerful, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of your main messages is that words are tools for building and not weapons for defending, which when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, like so accurate and so needed mm -hmm. with the cultural climate of our world right now, right? For sure, for sure. Yeah, I feel like, um, I mean, for me, that was an important, because I'm, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm a speaker, like, I like to talk, right? <laughs> so I'm always surrounded by words. And so I think that they, we forget the, the impact that words can have because we, we use them so often. There. And, and so for me, I needed that reminder that my, I'm going to use my words. Word, I can't avoid using words, but how I use them matters. And so am I using them to build people up or am I using them to defend myself or defend something that I love um, in a hurtful way? So, yeah. Oh, man, that's so good. Even with my kids, I feel like I want my words to be uh, – very calculated mm -hmm. that I'm speaking over them mm -hmm. because it's t reminding them who they're becoming, right? And so right. we're putting labels on them. And yeah. so I just – I love how, you, how succinctly um, – you share words that have such huge truths. Thanks. It's just tremendous. Um, and another thing I appreciate appreciate about you is that you get a little feisty about peacemaking, <laughs> I do. which are two words that I really like together. A feisty mm -hmm. peacemaker, for sure. That's like my favorite ever. And you say that when certain truths are forgotten, it makes you want to say, hold my purse, hold my earrings. <laughs> Have you ever actually said that in real life? Oh, I say, hold my purse, hold my earrings all, well, I mean, yeah, yes, I do say it in my real life. <laughs> There have been a few times in my life that I have said it. Okay, so, like, I love earrings, right? Big big earrings yeah. are, like, my love language. So, for me, uh, yeah, just is, like, a really appropriate thing for me to just, like, want to take all, everything off and defend someone or something that I love. Um, but I have to kind of balance that feistiness, that hold my purse, hold my earrings, with the truth that um, – the, the person on the other end that offended me or hurt me is like an actual real person mm. who's made in the image of God and that God delights over them the same way he delights over me. And so as feisty and angry as I get, I have to learn how to balance that with that truth, right? And so there have been times in my life where I've had to be really thoughtful about taking that anger and acknowledging that that anger is good because it points to something. It points to an injustice or it points to an area of brokenness that really affects me. And I need to say, yeah, that's broken. I think we need to be people who acknowledge that in order to be people who bring wholeness, right? So when I say, hold my purse, hold my earrings, it's that, it's that initial reaction of like, <laughs> something's not right. But then I have to go a little bit deeper and say, hmm. how, can I, how can I bring wholeness? and goodness in this situation. So totally. maybe I'll take back the person hearings at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so good. And I think when we pay attention to our anger, it really informs us, right? right. It helps us to like, um, to know what breaks the heart of God right. by being aware of that. Yeah. And you wrote the most beautiful manifesto called the Shalom Sisters Manifesto that gives words for how we can be a badass peacemaker, let's, for sure. let's say yes. that, um, in a way that honors the way of Jesus and also honors the people around us. And so tell me about where this came from. Yeah, so, I mean, 
I am not your typical peacemaker. I feel like a lot of times when we think about peacemakers, we think about either you're a peacemaker because you have the right personality, so you're sweet and you're kind and you're gentle. You're like Gandhi you're showing exactly. up or the Dalai Lama. And you're like total zen and you're like a delight to be around because you don't ruffle any feathers, right? Um, or you're a peacemaker by occupation. So like you're mm. the people that do the work of peacemaking. Like you join the Peace Corps, you have a degree in peacemaking and conflict resolution or you are a mediator and so you are actually actively doing peacemaking work but I feel like a lot of us don't fit into either one of those categories there's so many of us in the messy middle and a lot of times for moms I think we are always battling this sense of uh this season of being really intentional and being with our kids requires a lot out of us and so we can't take anything else on and so we feel like we can't fit in or do these big splashy things and for me, peacemaking felt like a big splashy thing hmm. um, that I couldn't really be a part of. One, because I don't have the personality because I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. <laughs> but then also, and so, but for me, I, I try to do the second part. When we lived in New Orleans, I really poured into this neighborhood that was known for gang violence. We, we were a part of revitalizing it from within. We loved that community, but then Hurricane Katrina happened and we had to leave New Orleans. And so I really had to make peace with the word peace and the idea of being a peacemaker. And so the Shalom System Manifesto came out of 40 days of studying peace in the Bible. And every instance of peace, I found that it pointed to this broader, deeper concept called Shalom. Hmm. So a lot of times when we hear Shalom, we think peace. But I think here in the West, we have a very surface idea of peace. It's like nothing nothing is uh, ruffled, like the waters are calm, very zen. Yep. We go to yoga all the time. Um, but I think God's idea for peace is so much richer. It's this idea of the world as it should be. Nothing wow. broken, nothing missing. Missing. If we think about like going back to Eden, that's shalom. Everything vibrant and flourishing and good. And so how, so a question that I ask myself now that helps me be a peacemaker, or what I like to call a shalom sister, is how can I be a part of creating goodness and flourishing right where I am? And if I'm doing that, then I'm being a peacemaker. And so the Shalom System Manifesto helps me kind of think of four different directions for, for creating wholeness and goodness between us and God. So I think about what are the areas that I feel broken or that need attention with, with my relationship with God? And then within myself, what are my own insecurities? What are the lies that I'm constantly telling myself that keeps me from being wholehearted? And then between me and the people in my life. So the lady who checks me out at Ross or my kids' teachers, my kids, my husband, the people who are in my like everyday life. And then and then being thinking about wholeness and goodness and broken systems in the world, which is kind of where we get that splashy idea of peacemaker to begin with. But like for me, when I say that I'm a shalom sister, it means I'm seeking God's best, his flourishing in every instance right now with what I have in my hand. I love that. Like in your home. In my home. And the small interactions with your kids every day. Yeah. So I say things like so the manifesto covers things like I'm invited, like God invites me along in this mm. journey of making the world whole, creating wholeness. I'm beloved. I'm enough. I will see the beauty. I'll rest. Um, I will choose subversive joy. So choosing uh, joy as a weapon against despair and a weapon against hopelessness. Um, we'll choose ordinary acts of peace all the way down to we will be peacemakers, not just peacekeepers. Wow. So these are things that I, I tell myself when I enter into a situation. Um, so, like, for instance, when my son was called the N-word by a teacher at school. I had to by, a, whoa, whoa, by a teacher By at a school. teacher at school. Holy crap. It was a really, it was, that was a hard season. But I had to be a peacemaker in that, right? Like, hold my purse, hold my earrings. <laughs> 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 but then I had to be a peacemaker. And so for me, I had to go into that. And there were, there were some manifesto points that I, I chose to, to remind myself I'll tell better stories. I had to tell a better story about this coach mm. that he didn't come to this place of, ignorance on his own that um you know he heard from people he trusted and he believes certain things about himself and he you know and so he's just a person that's subjected to a broken world with broken systems i have to tell myself that story and not just he's a terrible person that mm -hmm. i'm just going to beat up because i don't have earrings on so right. i'm better <laughs> and i'm gonna hit him with I my purse exactly <laughs> <laughs> um or or like you know um i had to tell myself that i will show up say something be still so you know i showed up for the meetings with him i said my piece but then i was really still to sit and listen to his side and to remember that he has a story and he's a human being too and come to a place where we can um, 
we can have unity and we can understand one another. And that, because I feel like a lot of times when we are hurt and we enter into a situation and we want a resolution, we come in with all this anger and bravado and we attack the other person that shuts them down. And so for me, I had to enter in that space and really listen to him and have a heart for reconciliation, even though I really didn't want to. Mm-hmm. But it all goes back to this idea that he is made in God's image and God delights over him too. And in so many ways, that act of reconciliation is counter everything that's happening in our culture right now mm-hmm. on a like a, a 30,000 foot level, right? It is right. like anti-reconciliation. It's like, I want to tell you my opinion, but I don't really care. There's not like a, exactly. a, a conversation happening, mm-hmm. right? So I just think that is a huge gift that you share with the world yes. to spread the message of I'm coming with open hands to have an open-handed conversation mm-hmm. and I want to understand your yeah. point of view. That's yeah. huge. How do you teach your kids to be compassionate in a world that feels oh. a little scary or yeah. aggressive? Yeah. So <laughs> it's funny because my husband and I are like really passionate, very stubborn people. And so for my husband and I to be like so passionate about peacemaking and, and unity and knowing that we're like, hold my purse, hold my ears to people. <laughs> it's always so funny when I try to teach my kids um, how to be compassionate because um, I think because a lot of times, and I think this is the case for a lot of things in my life, I can get so caught up in doing the work of whatever it is that I forget that there's something richer and deeper below mm. it. So there's, I have to, I have to uh, stop doing the thing that I think is comp- like in this case, compassion and really uh, examine like, what does it mean to be a compassionate person? What does it mean to have a posture of compassion in in the world? And so for the longest compassion, when I used to teach my kids about compassion, it was always, Oh, we do these these charity things, or we contribute to this, or we put together these care packages, like, oh, the church has an initiative, we're going to do that. That's our act of compassion. But I was noticing that my kids were not remembering the Imago Dei, like the image of God mm-hmm. in people. They were dis- they were disassociating kindness from, uh, from their everyday life. So, like, they weren't very, I mean... They're kids, so kids act a fool, right? <laughs> so they're not always kind, but they weren't realizing that kindness was an, an important social skill that they needed. Um, and they would, you know, but they, if you would ask them, like, do, do your parents do social justice work? Are your parents compassionate people? Do you guys do compassionate things? They would say, yeah, because we, and they would list all the stuff. So we had to go through a season in our family where we didn't do that stuff and we kind of went right to the heart of it. And the heart of compassion is remembering that people are precious. They're precious to God. Remembering that people have stories, that they're humans. I think um, social media and I think our, our phones and I think so much of the technology that we have that creates so many good, efficient things for us has contributed to us not connecting in real authentic ways and remembering that people are have emotions and feelings and and they matter, right? And so when I think about how I teach my kids compassion, we have like three sayings in our home and they go along with the Shalom system manifesto. So the first one is we will tell better stories. Mm, and so okay. we start with when somebody offends us or somebody hurts us and we want to just always tell them what they did wrong and we kind of want to respond big. Um, I stop my kids and I say, well, let's tell a story about them. What happened? What do you think happened to help them get to this place? Kind of like what I did with that coach. And so one time we got cut off in a carpool lane and I had, and the woman t- told me off. <laughs> She came up to my room and told me off. And um, and on our way home, my kids and I had to tell a story about her. Um, And my son made up this really fun story about, you know, maybe she had a bad day at work and she had a flat tire and, like, all these things that help humanize us and help mm-hmm. us enter into compassion for her. It's really cool because my we have a set of a young couple that's not married that's married that doesn't have any kids and so they've kind of adopted my kids and they do something similar like they go out for a meal and they'll say hey that guy in that red shirt tell tell me a story oh that's so good and so it doesn't always have to be like in the middle of trauma or crisis or a big blow up it could just be like you know you're sitting at a stoplight and there's somebody in an interesting you know in an interesting car tell me that story how they get that car that helps our kids have an imagination for compassion. That's such a great practical idea. I love that. Thanks. And then the um, the next thing we do is we it's a practice of calling out the beauty in other people. 
And so when my kids come home from school and they want to tell me about something that happened at school, like their teacher yelled at them or, you know, they were frustrated about something and they want to tell me about the person who frustrated them, they'll, they'll, they'll go right into it, right? Mandy, I don't know if your kids do this. <laughs> oh, for sure. That's the first thing <laughs> off the bus. Mommy won't believe what happened. Exactly. You won't believe what so-and-so did. Exactly. Yeah. And they want to tell you like word for word, totally. right? Um, but I'll stop them and I'll say, uh, what color are their eyes? Ooh, or wow. tell me something that they wore today. Or, um, and I'll, I'll make them stop and remember something about that person. And for me, that, that derails that, um, that train of anger and discourse that we just jump on so easily when we get offended or something bad happens to us. It stops it and it kind of reroutes it for good and beauty. And so we, we, we practicing the beauty in our home. And then the other thing is we do the work of compassion. So all those things that I mentioned before, like those are good things, but it's almost like faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have that deeper understanding of why we're doing it, it's just us, you know, doing something in vain, doing something just to do something. And, you know, I only have my kids for 18 years and I want to make it count. And so, yeah. That's so good. Okay, I'm totally using all of those ideas <laughs> when I go home tonight. Cool. <laughs> we have this thing because all three of my kids were fighting in the back seat. Mm -hmm. So we have this thing called the peacemaker, and they sit in the middle. You know, there's yeah. all these like in like dumb little family rules that Mandy, we have. Mandy, that's brilliant. But it, it's worked out for us. Is it only in the car? Mm -hmm. Okay, it only works. In the, in the car, car. Works in the car. Us, there yeah. are some things like there are some conversations that we have as a family that we can only have in the car and it kind of frustrates me because i'm like why can't we be this deep at home around yeah. the kitchen table yeah but i think the car is a very unique space they're all okay. kind of like going forward together someone gave me the tip of when my boys when my son was older that she was saying that the best conversations that she has with her son are when they're sitting next to each other in the car driving somewhere. Because mm -hmm. they're not, like, making eye contact. There's The pressure's off. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, that's just, like, when things go really deep. Oh, you know what? I just had an aha moment because that was my dad's thing. He would, like, just take one of us out every once in a while, and we would, like, just go. And there was this one restaurant that he loved that had the best chocolate milkshakes, in Galveston. So I'm from Southeast Texas. Love it. And so Galveston was like a 20, 30 minute drive. And he would take us, take one at a time, and, and we would go and drive back. And now I'm thinking, like, was it that? Was very strategic I on know. his part. <laughs> <laughs> a milkshake, a drive in the car. I'm a, I mean, come on, I'm a woman. Like, you can't, <laughs> you can't tell me there's chocolate there and I'm not showing up for it. Oh, oh that's no, that's so, so interesting. Good. Now I'm going to ask my dad if, if there was. If there was any strategy behind strategy, it. Or if he just, you know. Wanted a milkshake. Exactly. Because <laughs> as you do sometimes. Just one Totally. Milkshake. That's so good. Okay. So one of the tenets that you lead with in your manifesto is that people are more important than theological, political, or philosophical positions. And in so many ways, it feels like we've lost our vision for individuals. And we kind of talked about this earlier, that we're living in a culture that is like quick to categorize. Mm -hmm. And I think we've lost the art of looking each other in the eye. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was recently traveling and I was picking up my baggage from baggage claim. And so there were like a hundred people waiting around to get our bags and a hundred percent of the people were on their phones. And I just had this moment where it felt like we have, uh, we're missing out, right? Mm -hmm. We're missing out on those silly little conversations that happen around baggage claim or at the grocery store when mm -hmm. we're checking out that binds us together in a way that says we are all human and we all have these shared experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's a much happier, healthier like culture to live in versus when we're on our phones and isolating ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big believer at looking at the people around us and starting conversations with strangers like in random spots. How do you make looking people in the eye and creating a shared experience a, a big priority in your life? Yeah, so there's this thing that I do, and it's I, I like I call it customer service shalom because Ooh. it's a it's for for me it's an intentional way of moving about the world. So I can't get away of, from spending money. I can't get away from being in my car and having to go from one place to another. I can't. I mean. I am an extrovert, so I wouldn't want to be at home all the time, but I'm always out in the world. And so for me, I noticed that there was same sort of thing. I was forgetting that there were people on the other side of those important transactions or those everyday transactions. Um, you know, like if I call the bank because there's a discrepancy on my bill or, you know, I have to, you know, uh, 
go pick up a gallon of milk or things like this where I'm just interacting with people every day, but I'm not remembering that they're people. And so I started this thing where it was a season, it was a Lenten season. I tend to do big things around the season of Lent for me. It's really a transformative time, but I, I had like three rules and the, and these rules have just stayed with me, uh, since then. And that was several years ago. Okay. So the first rule was that I would always say their name. Ooh. So even, even if they, if they were not wearing a name tag, I'll say, Hey, what's your name? And then I'll say their name at the end of whatever transaction. So um, if we go out to dinner, I'll almost always say somebody's name, uh, the server's name. It's really important for me to call them by their name, to remind them that I see them, that they're not just somebody that's there to fill my water. So good. The, uh, the next thing I do is I tell them something that I'm thankful for that they did for me. So like if somebody's bagging my groceries, I'll say, thanks so much for putting the eggs on the top. That was, I really appreciate that. Or, oh, thanks for getting plastic bags instead of, or paper bags instead of plastic, you know. Um, so I, I tell them that I see them and I see that the work they're, they're doing. And then um, when I am out in the world, if I am interacting with, so it's not somebody that is serving me, but just somebody standing in line, if I see something, again, this goes back to the calling out the beauty. If I see something interesting, like a really cool tattoo, or that, like, I love that nail polish color, or I have the same bag. If I see something, or, or if she's with her kids and she's really holding it down, like, like those kids are really well behaved. <laughs> or even if they're blowing up. Like, I mean, if I see somebody and I feel this moment of like, yeah, me too, then I say, oh my gosh, I really love that you did this. Or I really love this about you. Um, just like the, uh, my favorite memory of this is so recent because... Uh, so my favorite color is yellow. I try to. You like, are wearing an I, amazing yellow jacket right now. Thank you. <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> and so, and, and this was like a really intentional. Like this is a practice of subversive joy for me because I love the color yellow and it makes me feel joyful. And so I was adding some more yellow pieces to my wardrobe, and I was um, at the store, and this woman came out in this beautiful yellow maxi, and. And she was a fuller figure woman and she was kind of standing in the mirror and she was like, I could tell, you know, that look, that look when you're looking, you're like, I like this, but, but I don't, uh, I don't know if I yeah, like this. Yeah, totally. Can like, I pull I it off? I know it looks good on me, but yeah. I could tell she was saying all the things in her head about uh -huh. what she didn't like. I could tell that moment because I've had that look on my face. Oh yeah, me too. And so I said, oh my gosh, I love that yellow on you. And then, like, she turned around, her face lit up, oh. and she goes, I wasn't sure that I was going to buy it. And I was like, I think you should totally buy it. And then she went, and we saw each other later, and she was with a friend, and she goes, that's the woman. That's oh, my gosh. She changed her entire day. Everything I mean, I, about the experience. I, yeah, but yeah. so for me, that is how I try. And I, I know because I'm an extrovert, those things sort of come more easily to me. Um, and so I think for people that are a little more shy or just trying it out, I think the very first one, just saying somebody's name, is a very, very ent easy entry point because um, they're wearing our name. And a lot of times, people use their names to tell them what they did wrong. Mm. Or they call the manager back and say, oh, Bobby didn't X, Y, Z. And so it feels a very vulnerable thing for them to have their name on them. And so if we can be women who reframe that, who use that for good, I think that's an amazing act of peacemaking. Wow. I'm on it. Next time I go to the store. <laughs> I'm there. Um, we talk a lot in our family, and I, I believe you do in yours too, about raising kids that are world citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and so we work really hard to expose our kids to different cultures and situations. And I actually like when we're somewhere and they see something that makes me a little uncomfortable or that's out of their norm because I love that we get to have a conversation with them rather than them having to contextualize things for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we just really love to like, if we see something like, let's have a conversation about it, or we yeah. experience something that's a little uncomfortable, like, let's talk about it. Yeah. And so, um, you have a big move on the horizon. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about it. But so it's awesome. Um, but it's hard to transfer kids to a new city, to mm -hmm. expose them to all new things, to help them navigate those situations well. And um, and you're li currently living in L.A., which I'm sure they've, you know, seen all sorts of things in yeah. L.A. And so how do you work to create world citizens in your kids? Hmm. Well, I think it, I think one of the things that is really valuable for me is making the world feel smaller than it is. And so I think that the more that I can tell my kids stories about other kids 
in, in different countries and they can understand their experiences and see the connection, sort of like that, oh, me too moment. I think that helps me, or I think that helps them want to, to learn more. That helps them want to engage more. I think it kind of breaks down that um, otherization that happens a lot when we look at somebody from a different country who speaks a different language, who dresses differently. But if I can say, oh, but they got on the bus this morning, just like you get on the bus, there's that shared experience that then maybe will be an entry point for them to learn more about their culture, about what, what their life is like. Um, I want to be really careful with my kids, too, because I think a lot of times we in the West have a lot of privileges and have a lot of resources. And so we can feel like the way we do life or the things that we have are the best. And so I try very hard to, when we meet somebody from a different country, I try to have them say, like, what is your favorite thing about your cuisine? Like, what's your favorite dish? Or what is their favorite thing about the transit system? Or tell me your favorite part of the architecture. like, And so that my kids can see like, oh, there is good and beautiful and intentional people all around the world, not just in my city, not just in my school, not just in my country. I think sort of just teaching them humility and teaching them an entry point are the first things into um, helping them be world citizens. Also adventure. I feel like we don't talk about making, being adventurous <laughs> totally. and doing things that are outside of our comfort zone and a little scary. So, I mean, my family loves doing these big world, like cross country moves. We moved from New Orleans to Boston, from Boston to LA. Now we're moving to LA to St. Paul. And people are like, wow, your kids are really adventurous. I'm like, yeah, but I think we do like small little adventures in our lives. Like we go hiking or we try something new um, or we, my husband and I love to debate. So my kids get to watch, <laughs> we'll, we'll argue. And that's a little bit of an adventure. Totally, so, totally. And so I think that those things I'm hoping raise world citizens. I, it sounds to me like you are helping your kids learn how to be curious. Yes. That's a great word. And that is uh, what better way to be a world citizen. Yeah. What is the best advice you never got? The best advice I never got. Um... Well, I think that the the thing that I wish that I heard, oh, here we go. The thing that I wish that I heard the most when my kids was were younger was that my everyday mattered. So like the small everyday things matter. I think um, when I was raising my kids, they're 15, 12, and 11, there were a lot of books that were coming out that were like big picture, like, you know, really deep concepts. Like we have to do, if you don't do everything in this book, then you're going to you know, ruin your kids. And so I got so hung up on trying to do everything right and trying to like create the perfect little human right in front of me. Like when I'm done with page 250 of whatever book. Right. And so I felt so overwhelmed. So all the time. And I wish that somebody told me that the small things that I do, the intentional things that I do, the sitting with them and being present with them, the loving them just the way they are, the listening to them talk about Teletubbies for the thousandth time. <laughs> I wish that somebody told me that those small acts are really what create compassionate, kind, good people. Um, and it's not necessarily like this how-to book, which I'm sure there's a lot of good tips in there. But I think we went through a season... I think now, if, if I were to raise my kids now, I feel like we're hearing this a lot, but when I was raising them, it was there was so much pressure on getting things right or a certain methodology or some new doctor was coming out with some totally. new idea, and it just felt so overwhelming. So I just wish somebody had told me, um, the small that you do right now matters. And also, here's another, <laughs> I know you didn't ask for a second one, but here's another one, that my kids are my kids for a reason that they have a bit of my DNA in them. And so if I love a good dance party in my living room, then they probably will too because they're my kids. <laughs> or, you know, that if, if there's a family culture of telling better stories, that they're going to be really interested in reading and storytelling, that, you know, that the things that I'm doing just as being Oshita um, is forming a, the culture and, and creating touch points for my kids to feel connected and, and to bond with me. So good. I love that so much. Yeah. Huh? Good mom. Thanks. Such a good mom. <laughs> so are there any books or resources that you would recommend? If someone is listening right now and thinking, I feel like I want to be a more active peacemaker mm -hmm. or I want to help my kids become more compassionate, mm -hmm. where would you send them? So the first thing, okay, so this is, I'm, I'm going to give some a resource for mamas. I'm going to give resources for 
like ministry leaders. Um, and I'm going to give a resource for uh, kiddos. Look at you. You're an overachiever. I know, right? I like it. <laughs> so, the, so the book that I love the most about the Hebraic concept of shalom, which is God's dream for the world as it should be, nothing broken, nothing missing, everything flourishing and vibrant. Um, the very the, the best book outside of, I guess, my own, <laughs> but the best book that I've read is called The Very Good Gospel by Lisa Sharon Harper. And that is a really good, compelling um, book on what is peace, what does God think about peace, what is shalom, and how does it, why does it matter to us right now. The next uh, resource is from The Meeting House, which is a church in Canada that I love. They have a children and family curriculum um, that is amazing because it really teaches us, uh, it really te helps us teach our kids about Jesus and the way that he loved people and, how, and the way that he was kind to people and the way that he reminded them that God delights in them. And it also points uh, kids, to, or it shows kids that they have a unique capacity, even though they're kids, to create good in the world. So it gives them lots of touch points and lots of ideas on how to be peacemakers. So that's a great resource. And then the book that I love to read to my kids, even though they're older and they're like, Mom, are you serious? I'm like, you're going to sit and listen. <laughs> but it's When God Made You by Matthew Paul Turner. And I just love that because I think at the heart of being compassionate people, at the heart of being people who are worldly citizens, who see, who look at people in the eye, at the heart of, of all of these practices is this reminder that God made us, that God delights in us, that every single person, even the person who we think about right now just turns our stomach because of something he or she said or he or she did, even that person, God made, God delights in them. And so for me, if my kids can always come back to that truth, um, I will feel like I'll, I was a successful mom. Okay, and you have to tell us about your book. Yes. <laughs> so I wrote a book called Shalom Sisters, Living, and the subtitle is Living Wholeheartedly in a Brokenhearted World. And it really is my love letter to every woman who wants to be a peacemaker, who recognizes that the world feels so broken and full of conflict, but she doesn't quite know where she fits into that. And so in the book, I go over the Shalom System Manifesto. I talk about our evacuation from Katrina and sort of me having to figure out, like I said earlier, uh, what does peacemaking look like for me now? How do I make peace? with the word peace. Hmm. Um, and so I go over the Shalom System Manifesto and there's a few recipes in there. And um, it really is, what I hope is, is that we were sitting together on a really awesome navy blue couch talking about peacemaking for, you know, in our everyday lives. So good. And I'm assuming it can be found it wherever can be found everywhere. It's Amazon. A, it's Amazon, Barnes & Noble, it can be found everywhere. One last question. Sure. Do you have any like peacemaking failures? Yes, I totally have a lot of peacemaking failures. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked this because I really, because I, <laughs> I shared a lot of things that we do, and I'm like, I'm, I'm great, but I'm not that great. <laughs> um, okay, so I do have a lot of peacemaking failures. I think um, I will tell you a peacemaking failure from just this week. So we are in the middle of moving, and uh, my husband and I are polar opposites on like just every possible way. Um, like we are the textbook opposites attract, right? And so I am very much like, okay, we need to systematize this move. Like we need to like label <laughs> are you boxes. like labels I am and color like, coding yes, and all I that. Yes, I am so, I'm so into that. And it gives me so much, I don't want to say life, but like, you know, security. Totally. Okay. Totally. Okay. So I live and list in little boxes. Okay. My husband is so not. Okay. And so we were, we were sitting together. And we were uh, at a coffee shop, and I was like, okay, I really need for you to listen, and I need for you to take notes <laughs> about this. And he was like, okay, whatever. But it was the same day that we had announced on Facebook that we were moving to oh, St. Paul. Gosh. And so you know how your phone starts to, like, yes. fill up? And so he kept looking, and I snapped at him in a coffee shop, and he was like, this is a really important, exciting moment, Oshita. And I was like, you're right. Oh. I need to be present with you and not so caught up on whether or not we're booking the right mover. <laughs> and so for me, like that was a peacemaking bell. But I mean, we kind of recalibrated, and and I and he he knew he knew that I needed it. In that yeah, moment. totally. But, um, but for me, Mandy, that was a moment where I said, "Okay, Oshita, we're you're gonna have a lot of moments like this over mm. the next three weeks because it's a it's a quick move." You um, are moving in three weeks. In three weeks. So by the time your listeners hear this, we will already be settled oh in Oh my Paul. goodness. Um, because okay, we wanted to note. because we wanted to meet beat the big no, go ahead. Oh that's no, that's that's super smart. Yeah. But are you one of those people who like the second day after you move, everything's in its place and all the boxes oh, no, are unpacked. Oh, no, no, uh, no. Okay. I am organized in the front end, and then I'm like, let me just uh, 
sit and watch Netflix. Okay, that on makes my new me couch. feel a little better. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta balance it out somehow. <laughs> uh, uh, Crockpot and Netflix for like the first week after we moved. Really, okay, that's good. that's my life. Good. But, um, but I, I thought, okay, well, I can, I'm gonna have a lot of these moments, and the kids are not going to be as self reflective and self aware as my husband to say like, I need for you to be excited with me right now. And so I had to tell myself, I am only going to worry about my stuff. Like, are my things packed? <laughs> and are, like, are the things <laughs> that matter to else, me? Like... And, like, and I will, like, give gentle reminders. And I will say, I need this done because the movers are coming by this day. If it's not packed, it doesn't come. It goes with the That's charity super truck. Fair. But I had yeah. to be, I had to kind of let go of that and not get my sense of worth or identity from the work that I can do around the move. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now go out and have more fun and don't come back until you do.